Many videos on this channel are about CNC machining parts at home on a hobby mill. Before you can machine parts though, you need a 3D CAD model. And before you can do that, you need an idea. In this video, we're going to take a guitar maker's idea for a fretboard radiuser, bring it to life in 3D CAD, and refine it to be makeable with equipment you might find at home or in a small garage like this one. Sean runs a YouTube channel called Scar My Guitar, where he makes custom guitars in his garage for guys like Justin Johnson. This was built by a dude named Sean from, uh, he's got a YouTube channel called Scar My Guitar. Well, I gotta say, Sean's off to a pretty good start with this fretboard. And because this is just amazing, here's Justin playing a shovel. This is the fretboard of a guitar. It's crowned across the neck and needs to be totally straight along its length. Sean tells me that custom guitar makers often use these radius sanding blocks to get the fretboard shaped. And they're not great. So he converted a drum sander by making a custom curved drum, and it works really well. But it's a big and bulky machine that does a small job, so Sean has an idea for a smaller benchtop version, and about a week ago, he sketched it out for us. The heart of the machine is that custom drum. It has a very intentional shape and diameter, and that's a good thing. Having too many options usually means you don't have enough information. This drum has a 4-inch outside diameter with a curve in it that'll make a 12-inch radius on a 3-inch wide fretboard of any length. The idea is that the drums can be changed for different radius fretboards. To model it, we start with a sketch that'll make up half the drum when revolved. Then we'll mirror it to get the whole drum. Sean applies these strips of abrasive in a kind of spiral pattern around the drum, which is a tricky thing to model if you try to do it in one feature. If you're clever with combining bodies though, it becomes real easy. I always say to stop merging bodies by default when modeling in SolidWorks. It's a mistake I made for a really long time, and here's why. We model this shell body wrapped around the drum, then twist this 44 degree pizza slice across the drum. Because we've kept them as separate bodies, we can choose to make a body out of the volume where they intersect using the combined feature, which, incidentally, is the shape of the sandpaper. We could have also used the wrap feature, but doing it this way gives us a little more control. We drew the pizza slice to have a 44 degree angle at its tip, so when you apply an 8x circular pattern to the sandpaper, you'll know all the strips will lay into each other perfectly with a small gap separating them. So what else have we got? Sean's drum sander has the drum cantilevered from the frame, which he says isn't very rigid. It's also driven by a direct drive 4-pole AC motor that has to move up and down with the roller, which is a lot of moving weight, and I don't love that. Instead, we could have the motor-roller combo rigidly mounted and bring the workpiece to the drum with something like this scissor jack, so let's model it. If you look at it carefully, it's full of symmetry and patterns, and we're going to use it to our advantage to work quickly. First, notice the top and bottom plates are the exact same part, and they're symmetrical about what I chose as the right plane. So we draw out the base plate, ballparking the dimensions just based on the way it looks in Sean's hand, and model the angled bracket as a solid body before converting it to sheet metal. If you need to model sheet metal, look into the Convert to Sheet Metal feature in SolidWorks. It saves a ton of time, and I can't remember the last time I modeled the sheet metal part without it. The scissor links are even easier. We could have used symmetry here too, but the part is so simple I modeled it in one step. Let's throw the base in an assembly, assemble the links on one side of the jack only, mirror them, and cap it all off with the top plate, which is just another instance of the bottom plate, and we've got a scissor jack. Let's head to McMaster Car's website and grab a model for a hand knob. If you're into 3D modeling and don't know about McMaster Car, this video may have just changed your life. They've got 3D models of almost everything you'll need to build any project with the prices included. You don't need to sign up for an account, you just head over, grab what you need, and throw it in your design. As if it wasn't already easy enough to give McMaster Car your money, they've also developed a SolidWorks plugin that'll automatically create a bomb of any McMaster parts used in your assembly, and you can order them in SolidWorks. They're like the Amazon of the CAD world, and shipping is just as fast, or faster than Amazon. You definitely pay a premium, but man is it ever worth every penny. So we've got the drum and scissor jack. We need a motor and some way to control it. Head right back to McMaster Car and grab a motor roughly the same size as the one you plan on using. Then throw it all into an assembly and see what it starts looking like. Okay, so we know the motor's directly driving the drum, and the scissor jack's supposed to bring the fretboard up to the drum like it is in the sketch. Now we've got to hold all this stuff together somehow, and a good rule of thumb when designing something is to almost always design from the inside out. Maybe it's just me, but I find it tempting when designing to design from the outside in. It's that feeling of wanting to design something that fits in a box, so you make the box first, and then start building your idea inside of it. Look at Sean's sketch. He draws the box first, then starts adding parts inside of it. Okay, maybe it's just me and Sean that gets sucked into it. I've heard good designers say to always do it in the opposite order. Start with the guts of the thing, like this drum. We know it needs to be at least 4 inches in diameter so it doesn't clog up quickly, and we can use a very standard 4-pole single-phase AC motor to get the sandpaper surface speed we want. If you start with the box first, then start building the idea inside the box, you'll find you might run out of design space by the time you get to the middle. You'll see it happen to me later in this video and I can't design the thing I want because I run out of space. So this is how I interpreted Sean's sketch when trying to make it 3D. This is the part where I like to step back and think about why we made this thing. We didn't like that the motor and drum moved up and down, so we made them rigidly fixed. I still like that. 
We use the scissor jack to bring the workpiece up to the drum instead of moving the motor up and down, and I still like that idea, but there might be a simpler, maybe more rigid way to do it. Sean added these spring-loaded hold-down wheels to keep the fretboard from bouncing around, and I don't love the way these ended up. One of the key requirements of the drum sander is to have the drums quickly changeable, and with the way I've got all this laid out, it's not going to be easy to change that drum out, let alone quick. We know we can't change the drum and motor, and we like the idea of having them rigidly fixed to the workbench, not moving up and down. So what about going back to the simplest thing possible? A nice, heavy plate that's easy to machine and everything can be accurately mounted to. We didn't like the cantilever drum, so let's support it on both sides with some brackets and bearings. This sliding square support would be easy to machine, and it's nice and bulky and should hold the fretboard firmly. The fine adjustability of the scissor jack with this hand knob was also really nice, so let's head back to McMaster Car and grab another threaded knob that'll give us some adjustment. We can 3D print this kind of housing, press a nut into the front, and we could thread this knob in and use it to push the block forward from the back. We can lock the block down with this 3 8 bolt that threads into a nut that can slide but not spin in this slot on the bottom. We got rid of half the wheels from the first design of the tensioner, but I'm still not in love with this. This design seems to be a little more quick change friendly, but it still seems a little fiddly. You'd undo the top two bolts on this funny kind of retaining plate on this weird bulky column, then be able to pull the drum off. I think we're getting there, but maybe we can do better. Let's step back again and take a look. The column and support are a little bulky, and the base plate needs to be quite a bit longer to support them. Sean needs the drum to be stiff and rigid, or he won't make a nice fretboard. But it'd be nice to get rid of this bulky support. I spend a lot of time looking at this spindle. It's kind of a cantilever tool that sticks out and has to be rigid in order to cut material. But it's only supported on one side, and it's still strong. The stock head on the PM30 uses tapered roller bearings to rigidly support the spindle. And we can make the same kind of thing to support the drum. Let's grab some tapered roller bearings from McMaster Car and build a little spindle. Here are two bearings that are almost the same. They're both 1 and 31 30 seconds in outside diameter, 3 8 wide, but have a 64th in difference in the inside diameter. It's a good idea to select something like this pair, and if you think you know where I'm going with this, leave me a note in the comments. Okay, so we're making up this little spindle cup thing to hold the shaft nice and rigid with preloaded tapered roller bearings. If we hollow out the bottom side of the drum, we can sneak this little assembly inside the drum, which is nice. It doesn't make our design any bulkier, and it increases the rigidity. We can use the motor's bolt's axial force to seat the spindle without having to add any more bolts or threaded holes in the plate. And it looks like we're winning on the quick change. We've now only got to undo one bolt to slip the drum off the spindle. Kind of like an angle grinder. And this is where I started from the outside in and sort of ended up against the wall. I started by choosing the bearings that I thought would give us enough space for the inside of the design, which is kind of like drawing the box to put your ideas in before you know what they are. So we ended up with a tight, deepish half-inch hole with a tiny little keyway that the motor connects to. This won't be too much fun to make. There's no doubt this would be nice and stiff, and I actually kind of like this design, but we don't really need tapered roller bearings. They're a little overkill. Maybe we can simplify the shaft and bearing arrangement if we use a shaft coupling and only one ball bearing. We could piggyback off the motor's bearings on the other side to keep things rigid and wouldn't have to machine that little internal keyway. Tapered rollers do a great job taking high axial loads with a little runout, which is why you might find them in a mill spindle, but we're not going to need that kind of precision and we're not going to see much axial load. We'll also need some way to space the motor off the main plate to make room for the new shaft coupling. I'm using this spacer, but we could also extend this cylindrical turned housing, which might be a better idea. And instead of using rollers to keep the fretboard from bouncing around, maybe we can use some 3D printed sliders with these pressed in nylock nuts. The nuts would grip the threads of these screws tight enough to prevent them from rattling loose, but still let us adjust the spring tension by tightening the screws. The last important factor in the design is to have some kind of dust collection, and 3D printing might make this real easy. It would need to be easily removable for access to the drum, so maybe we could have it slide on and off from the front with something like this little thumb screw to retain it. So after a little bit of brainstorming and clicking around in CAD, we've ended up with four designs in 3D we can think about. Ideas on paper are great, but when you build them in 3D, they're correctly proportioned from every angle and you can imagine standing in front of them, how big they are, what they'd feel like if you've picked them up, and all without spending a penny. For me, building and refining something in 3D is about giving yourself the confidence that it'll go together exactly the way you planned on the first shot. Now, these are just ideas and there's a lot of missing details, and I know Sean has more thoughts of what we can do differently, but with every iteration we gain another thing to put on this bench top, and we can pick and choose all the things we like and discard the things we don't. In the coming weeks, Sean will be physically building this fretboard radiuser, so if you want to follow along, head over and subscribe to his channel. I'll leave a link in the description where you can find him. So everything in this video was done in a software called SolidWorks, which not everybody has access to, but if you're interested in 3D design, you've picked the best time to get started. In the last few years, Autodesk's developed a very powerful and very free design software called Fusion 360, and it can do everything you've seen me do in this video.
You can download it right now, and after a couple YouTube tutorials, you'll be making 3D things in a few minutes. If you have or decide to get a CNC machine, Fusion 360 also comes with a built-in cam that'll let you program toolpaths and generate the G-code for your CNC machine to make your parts. If it isn't totally clear what all this means, just know it's a very big deal. Up until Fusion 360, fully featured 3D CAD design programs worth thousands of dollars, and the CAM softwares that let you program toolpaths to make parts on a CNC machine were even more expensive. Fusion 360 not only bundled these two things together, which in itself has huge benefits, they've made it free. So there really has never been a better time for the hobbyist to get into making stuff. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed the video.